For as much as many have taken to set in hand an order, a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world, it seemed good to me also, having perfect understanding in all things, from the very first to write unto thee an order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph <coughs> of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in that 
And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory Glory to God God in the the highest, and and on on earth earth peace, peace, goodwill toward toward men. men.
And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. It came till it came and stood still over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented them unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh.
It's Christmas once again. Yes, it's that time of year. To reflect now and then and wish that you are here. To talk about the story about a baby born one night, a king without his glory who left his throne of might. The babe grew into a child and the child became a man. The king dwelt among his people, but they would not understand. God left his heavenly splendor. The sun came from above. He became a simple servant to show that he was love. Then one day he died, crucified upon that tree. Even now I wonder why. Why did he die for you and me? Christmas without Easter is only half the story. Jesus, the Son of God, arose again in glory. He didn't come that night just to give us a holiday. He came to give us life and showed us he was the way. Emmanuel, our God, is with us, as the prophets had foretold. He redeemed us with his precious blood, not with silver or with gold. The wise men later brought their gifts, knelt and worshiped at his feet. Like a wise man, will you give your heart to the Prince of Peace?
Thank you again for coming this evening. Didn't the choir and the instrumentalists do a great job tonight? And when they're not quite done, they've got a few more, at least one more song that we're going to sing at the end. But permit me just for a moment or two to bring all of this into focus. Um, first of all, we're glad you're here. I didn't know with the COVID surge that's going on, we never know what to expect, right? That's the story of our lives recently. But thank you for being here tonight. Take the year 1809. The international scene was tumultuous. Napoleon had been sweeping through Austria. Blood was flowing freely. Nobody really cared about little babies during that time. But the world was overlooking some very significant births in 1809. Let me remind you. For example, William Gladstone was born that year. Maybe he, you don't, uh, he's not a familiar name to you, but he was destined to become one of England's finest statesmen. That year, Alfred Lord Tennyson was born to an obscure minister and his wife, the wonderful poet. The child would one day affect greatly the literary world in a, in a very remarkable manner. On the American continent, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Also, not far away in Boston, Edgar Allan Poe began his eventful, albeit tragic, life. It was also in that same year, 1809, that a physician and his wife, by the last name Darwin, gave birth to a child named Charles. In that same year, 1809, produced the cries of a newborn baby in a small log cabin in Hardin County, Kentucky. The baby's name was Abraham Lincoln. Now, if there had been a news broadcast in that day, I'm sure it would have said something like, the destiny of the world is being shaped on the Australian, or Austrian battlefield today. But really, what was happening is, history was not being made on the Austrian battlefields. History was being made in the cradles of that year. Because no matter what it was, that those men and ultimately women grew up to be, they were very influential. And I would say that most of us know their names rather than the battlefield in Austria that Napoleon fought on. What I'm saying today is oftentimes we are overwhelmed by the news of the day. And we often come to the point where we are so overshadowed by the events of today that we lose sight of what happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future. And I want to tell you today that the wonderful news that we sang about, this was, this was encouraging, the music was delightful, I hope it was even entertaining, but here's the fact of the matter, don't miss the message of these words and of these songs. You see, they're wonderful Christmas songs, but at the very core of all of this is the truth that there was a baby born thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago now, that would change the course of all of human history. And tonight I want to bring you face to face with that. I don't want you to know the Jesus of Sunday school or the Jesus that we talk about glibly or that we recognize existed. I want you to see tonight the Jesus that wants to have a relationship with you personally. And I want you to come face to face with that. Isaiah 53, the prophet said this, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, that, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not." You see, the same thing that happened to all of those babies that year in 1809 and how they were overshadowed by the events of what was happening in Europe at that time is the same thing that happened to the Lord Jesus when he was born. As a baby, he was not recognizable. As a matter of fact, you would have come and seen him and, and, and it wouldn't have barely registered with you other than this was a little baby and that's a wonderful thing. I go now to December of 1903. After many attempts, the Wright brothers finally got their flyer off the ground in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And they flew for 120 feet 
And it was a great, a me, a matter, uh, as a matter of fact, that flight changed the course of human history, I would say, dramatically, because from that came the principles of flight that we apply to even modern aircraft. But they were thrilled, and they telegraphed their message back to their sister, Catherine, here in Ohio. And they, they telegraphed this, we have actually flown 120 feet. We will be home for Christmas. Back then, you had to keep it short. Isn't it amazing how technology has come around? The telegraph had to be short because it cost money for every letter you put on there. And now we have things like Twitter and texting, and we change the word two to the, to the number two and all those kind of things. It's amazing, isn't it? Are we really that advanced? I don't know. Anyway, they sent this telegraph message back. We've actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper there, and she took it to them and showed him the message, and he glanced at it and said, Oh, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas completely missing the significant fact of them flying 120 feet. What am I saying in all of this? I'm saying that we as human beings oftentimes can be deluded, we can be deceived, we can miss the important details even though they're smacking us in the face. And I tell you tonight, as a human being, I I'm a human being, you're a human being, we've got a problem. And that problem is not that you're not a kind person or that you're not nice or that you're not faithful to your job or to your spouse. The problem is that you have a sin problem that has caused you to be separated from God. And I tell you, most of us miss that fact. We grew up believing that we're a pretty good person. I'm thankful for good people. I, I believe that there are good people. But the, at the very foundation, the Bible says that everyone has broken God's holy law. There is not one who is not guilty. My friend tonight, I know you came to hear good news and I'm about to give it to you, but I've got to tell you the bad news first and that is that it doesn't matter what your background is, what your religion is, it doesn't matter how your socioeconomic status or your ethnicity, what matters is we all have a common problem and that is sin and we've broken God's law. But here's the answer to that common problem and this is the very good news that I want you to hear tonight. That's the subject of every song that we've sung. It's the subject of the verses that we've read. And that is that Jesus came, not just, oh, that's a nice little baby, or, oh, that's a really special thing. Man, that's a miraculous birth. But he came, the Bible says, so that humanity, mankind, can know and be redeemed back to God. My friend, tonight, that can only happen through this baby Jesus who would grow into a man and ultimately die on the cross unjustly for your sins and mine. I tell you, that, that night when Jesus came to this earth on that little, in that little Bethlehem town, there were two responses. We sang about the uh, shepherds that came and they were in their field watching their flock by night and the angels came the angel came and said to him uh, fear not uh, behold there's born unto you a savior which is Christ the Lord and this shall be a sign unto you you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger that doesn't seem very significant does it but I'll tell you something that night those shepherds believed what they heard how many of you would believe an angel if you saw him in the sky <laughs> no problem <laughs> You know, they believed what they heard. There's, the Savior is born. This is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for. And the Bible says they came with haste and they ran in and they found exactly what the angels had said. Mary and Joseph and there was a little baby lying in a manger and they rejoiced because they saw what they had expected and they believed that this was the one that they were waiting for. Now, I'll tell you that night, there was a lot of people that didn't hardly roll over in their beds. There was a lot of people that may have heard, hey, there was some, some kind of commotion, you know, and I'm sure on their next door app they said, hey, what's going down at the inn tonight? Seems like there's a lot of commotion going on down there. But it probably didn't change their lives at all. And tonight I want you to see that all of us tonight, and I'm, I appreciate you being here, I'm speaking to this crowd, and if I had the whole world, I would say this to the whole world. But since you're here, I'm saying it to you. The fact is that there's two groups of people sitting here tonight. Those that recognize Jesus for who he was, the Lord of all, God in the flesh. 
The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 that this child would be born that would be called Emmanuel, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God. Emmanuel, God with us. God, the creator of the universe, the one who is supreme in all things, made himself a human so that we could underst- he could understand and know what, it's, what we went through. The Bible says he was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He knew hunger. He knew loneliness. He knew all of the things that we go through. But yet he was the God of heaven so that he could die in our place. And so you either believe that he is who he said he was and who he is, or you're in that group that kind of say, yeah, Jesus, that's a great name. That's a great story. That's a great person. He was a good person. And we yawn and we go on and it doesn't do a thing for us. I want to say tonight, this is the good news that we celebrate. Why do we spend hours practicing music? Why do we decorate? Why do we get together and celebrate? Oh, it's a nice holiday. Yeah, that's great. But if it doesn't mean more than that to you, you've missed the whole meaning. It's like that editor saying, oh, great, the boys will be home for Christmas. You missed it all. I want to tell you tonight, Jesus was rejected when he came, even by his own. The Bible says in John chapter 1, permit me as I read the scripture here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that word, Word, is actually what it's talking about, Jesus The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, that is, the Jewish people, and his own received him not. They missed the message of that night. How tragic. I tell you tonight, I would say this, it would be super tragic for us to live our whole life celebrating Christmas, recognizing kind of the basic religion behind it, but never knowing personally that man, Jesus, for ourselves personally. And so he was rejected. The big news of this time of year was the fact that Jesus was born, and yet so many of us miss it in the details. We miss the message. That truly is the glory of Christmas. But I want to tell you tonight, the blessed news is, yes, he was rejected by his own, but he can be received even today. You see this Jesus that grew up and became a man and ultimately lived and died on the cross and was buried. The Bible teaches very clearly that he rose again the third day. Now, I know this isn't Easter, but permit me to jump ahead just a few months. We celebrate Easter, but let me tell you, without... Easter, there would be no Savior. Because as a dead Savior, he means nothing. And if Jesus is still in the grave today, and if his body is still there, he's just like any other person. A good man that had good message and did good on this earth, but that's all. Let me tell you tonight, my friends, his resurrection from the dead changed everything. Only God could raise from the dead. We believe the Bible teaches that he rose from the dead and he was seen of above 500 and he goes through all the disciples and he sees all kinds of folks there on, after that uh, time that he rose from the dead. And then on the 40th day after he was raised, he went to heaven, ascended, the Bible says, from the Mount of Olives. And the angel came and said, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that has gone away from you into heaven will come again in like manner as you've seen him go. Let me tell you today, we don't serve a dead Savior. You've heard it said, God is not dead. I tell you, he's as alive today as he ever was. And the fact is that just as much as Jesus did good then and died and was saving men then, he is still saving men today. And the blessed news is that when you understand the intersection of your life and your sin and how you have broken God's law and you recognize the fact that there is guilt that I am carrying that I will one day pay for, let me tell you, when that intersects with the blessed truth of Christmas, it changes everything. And I stand here today not as some person that's got some special revelation. I just read the Bible. And there was one day when I, as a sinful person, met the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in John 1, 12, but as many 
uh, I'll read verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You could read that in your Bible. John 1, 12. And I tell you today, the difference between someone who knows Jesus personally and someone who completely misses the details of the day is the difference between someone who has received that little baby and ultimately that Savior who died for them personally and those that go on saying, that's a good story. I remember hearing that in Sunday school. Or I, I, I know about this guy named Jesus, but he does nothing for me. There's no personal relationship. Let me tell you tonight, the good news of Christmas and this is the best news I think that you can ever hear in your whole life. Better than you got a raise or your Christmas bonus is here or whatever the best news is that you can hear. The best news is that Jesus, the baby in the manger, grew up to be the Savior of the world. And that means those who receive him. Have you received the Lord Jesus? Pastor, what does that mean? Well, I know there's a lot of confusion for that. If... um. If we were in a Pentecostal church, they'd say, you know, you have to receive the Holy Spirit, and they do all kinds of stuff. And if you're in a certain kind of church, you have to do this to receive the Lord. Let me tell you tonight, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There was a man, and I'm, I'm almost done, John chapter 3. This Nicodemus came to Jesus. He was a high-up ruler a Pharisee, well-respected, but he had some questions. He came to Jesus by night, and uh, he said to Jesus, how can I get to heaven, essentially? I think that's a good question for all of us to ask. Jesus, the very Son of God, said to him this, you cannot, except you be born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus thought to himself, wow, that's weird. I gotta be born again? I gotta enter into my mom's belly again and be born? Jesus said, no, you're born that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the water first, that's natural birth. But then you must be born of the Spirit. That is, you have to enter into God's family. Marvel not, Jesus said, that I say unto you, you must be born again. I want to tell you here today, the fact is that Jesus himself, from the Word of God, said, except ye believe, ye shall likewise perish. The bottom line is this. It's not about membership of a church. It's not even about doing things, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace through faith. That is, my friend, tonight, if you would just simply say, I believe who Jesus said he was, and I recognize my sinful state. If I could give an illustration tonight, I used it earlier. I think I might have used this on Christmas Eve. Pardon me if you were here. But if I'm drowning in Lake Erie, I don't need someone to come and teach me what I need to do. There's an instinct in me that says, help, right? And I mean, I'm going to scream and do my best to get out of that. Now, if I'm truly drowning, I'm, I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do. I am at the mercy of some wonderful soul who's passing by that happens to have a life raft and they, or a life vest, and they can throw that life raft to me, and I'm shouting and waving and however I can, and I get a hold of that life raft, and I cling on to it, and they pull me in, and I would consider myself to be saved from drowning, Right? So I'm saying tonight, how many of you tonight would realize, wow, you know, I recognize that I am a sinner. I've broken God's law. Now, I'm not saying you're not a good person. I'm not saying you don't care about your family. I'm just saying at the very base level, you are a sinner and broken God's law. And as such, the Bible says that we have requirement of judgment. Well, when I realized that, all of a sudden, my life intersects with a Savior who says, I've come to save you from that punishment. And all you need to do is accept what I've done for you. I'm telling you, that's the best news ever, isn't it? I didn't make that up. That's, that's what this is all about right here. The whole Bible from beginning to end has the thread of God's rede redemption of mankind. As a matter of fact, if you look at history, you can look at all the events of history from beginning to end, from recorded history up until now, and even now, a little bit into the future, we can see and we can understand that God's plan has been from the beginning of time to redeem man back to himself. Even the advent of the Lord Jesus was at the exact time when God said, the Bible says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth a man born of a woman. 
I'm telling you, God had it perfectly planned. He had the, politi the political climate exactly what he wanted. He had the economic climate exactly what he wanted. He had the language that he wanted, and everything was there, and Jesus came. Let me tell you today, this, our history is really his story of God's redemption of mankind. Here's the question. Are you going to be like that editor in Dayton, Ohio, that looked at the, looked at the uh, telegraph and said, oh, good, the boys will be home for Christmas? Or are you going to be the one that recognizes, wow, the story of Christmas is about a man, a baby, Jesus, who was God in the flesh. And he came to affect my life. He came to affect your life. That's the good news. Here's my invitation, and I'm done. Pastor, you never told me how to receive the Lord Jesus. What do I got to do? Can I tell you some good news again? You don't got to do anything. The Bible says Jesus, when he died on the cross, one of his last words was, it is finished. You know what that means? The price has been paid. There's nothing left to do. You said, how do, I, how do I receive it? You've got to receive it by faith. It starts here with an understanding of your sin, a recognition of who you are as a human. But then it goes to your heart, and you say, that Savior that died for me, that person that died on the cross was for me. And I, the Bible says that we, we attribute that or we accept that as the truth for ourselves. Here's one more illustration, I'll be done. You all came in tonight and sat on these chairs. And I'll have you know, one of these chairs is falling apart. I'm not going to tell you which one. But nobody thought about that. Actually, it's over there, so you don't have to worry about it. Literally, the seat fell off before the service. Now, nobody came in here tonight and kicked the chair and, huh, yeah, that looks pretty sturdy. I didn't see anybody turn it upside down and check to make sure all the screws were in it. You just came and sat down in that chair. Now, here's what I'm saying tonight. Your, your trust right now is in that chair. You're resting in it. Matter of fact, up until this point, nobody thought anything about it. <laughs> I think they're all safe. <laughs> but here's the point. You're trusting in that chair. We trust in all kinds of things. You trust when you go home tonight that the person coming at you is going to stay on the left side of the line. What I'm saying tonight is, are you trusting that Jesus is your Savior, that he died for you? Or you might say, well, I'm actually trusting in something else, Pastor. I, you see, I was raised such and such a religion or such and such a belief, or actually I was raised with no belief, and so uh, I just believe that when I die, I'm going to die, and I'm, there's nothing going to be left. And I say, that's great. You're trusting in that truth. Where did you get that truth from? What's the foundation of it? I'm just saying, as a human telling another human, I want to trust someone who has never lied and never had anything wrong, done anything wrong. He was perfect. And so I'm going to trust what he says. You see, it's just a matter of faith, what you believe. So tonight, if you would just simply transfer your trust from what you have been believing to what Jesus has done for you, the Bible says, you will be saved. But as many as received him, John 1, 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. My friend, I don't care, I shouldn't say that. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you what you come from, what you've done, that is the best news you will ever hear in your life. But it's up to you. Will you receive it or not? It's not up to me as pastor. It's not up to our church. It's not up to your church. It's between you and God. But it's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. The Bible says it's almost like a little child. You just, I have little children. I've got five or six. They're not little anymore. It used to be, they would stand on the step, hey, Dad, let me jump to you, right? And they'd jump, and I'd catch them. And at first, there was a little fear and trepidation, but after they knew Dad was catching them, now they'd start throwing themselves off of the stairs, even when I'm not looking. Or I turn around, I'm like, okay, that's good, and all of a sudden, kaboom, on my back. Whoa! What am I saying? Here's the point. They trust Dad, and they just throw themselves out on Dad, childlike faith. Now, those of you that are wiser and smarter, you're looking at me like, I'd never do that. Because you know I can't catch you. But we can look at Jesus and know that he will, he is capable, he has done the work. You can jump out onto him. It, faith, the, the greatest lie about faith is that it's blind. There's nothing blind about faith. We have every evidence, every proof. All, faith really is a decision. I'm encouraging you tonight, just 
call on the Lord Jesus in your own heart and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I understand that I'm, I'm going to face the punishment for my sin. There's no way that I can ever be perfect. And I trust that you are the one who can redeem me to God. Your relationship with God is the hole that's missing in your heart. And I hope tonight that you'll take advantage of that. Isn't the, the Christmas story amazing, isn't it? The miracle of Jesus coming was so that you and I can be put together with God again. We can be made friends of God. And that's my message. That's the message of Christmas. Shall we bow our heads and close our eyes? The choir is going to sing one more song before we're done, but I just want to give you an opportunity with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Between you and God, this doesn't have to do with me. I'm just another human being. But you have a responsibility for God. You cannot go from here and for the rest of your life, you cannot say, I never knew what Jesus did for me. And I believe tonight that that's a crossroads that many of us find ourselves at. That's the crossroad I found myself at. And I had to make a decision to receive the Lord Jesus. Now, I don't know hearts. I, can't, I don't know your background. I don't know your heart. You don't know mine. We can't see each other's heart. All I can say is this is what God's Word says. And I want to encourage you tonight. If that is something burning in your heart, would you just quietly in your own heart just say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I, like that person drowning in a lake, I cry out for help. I know I need help. I know I need a Savior. And would you transfer your trust tonight into the Savior from whatever you're trusting in? Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for the truth, the glorious truth of Christmas. Lord, we rejoice in it. We sing it. We celebrate it. We, we decorate for it. Lord, we, we thank you for what it is. But Lord, it's not just the holiday. It's the Savior that came for the redemption of mankind. And Lord, to those that receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Thank you for that wonderful promise. And tonight we can know personally the Savior, not know about Him, but Lord, we can truly know Him. And I pray tonight that if there's one searching heart, that Holy Spirit, you would deal with that and you would draw them and that they might accept that gift tonight. What a wonderful Christmas gift that would be. Do your work, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, we're going to be dismissed tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, again, in these uncertain days, we weren't sure if we were going to have anybody. And I'm very, very thankful for the crowd that we had tonight. Thank you. And I hope that you've enjoyed the music. I hope you've heard the truth. And I hope that you've been maybe taught something tonight that you can take with you. It's a very important thing. I'll close with this thought. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, He would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If, God, if our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a Savior. And I'm so thankful for that tonight. I hope that you know the Savior who is Christmas. Well, we're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer. I hope you'll take some time and greet each other. And It's been a joy. I hope that uh, your new year is bright. And uh, I'm thankful for God's promises. If there's any questions you have or any concerns, need prayer in any way, I'd love to talk to you. I'll be around here afterwards, but it's great to have you tonight. Let's stand together, and uh, we're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer this evening. Shall we pray?